We got a special treat for everybody today. It's a great, this is Gavin Mail. We got Jack Pitts on with us today. So uh, Jack, you know, how you doing, buddy? It's great to see you again. Aces, I'm aces. Uh, the, the court case is long, uh, getting up very early. It's ruining my, uh, my daily routine, but it's worth it because I didn't do a lot of jury duty in my life. So I feel like I'm doing all my jury duty on this. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like my perspective is, is so different from everyone's that, I, which kind of shocks me, but it is what it is. So, uh, you know, happy to share my perspective on that and anything else you want to talk about. All right, perfect. Well, thank you. So that's why I wanted to hook up with you because I feel like there's not enough people out there who are talking about this case. I, I mean, I'm reading your tweets. I'm reading your, your, your articles. You know, I love the Josie Wells one, by the way. I don't know if anybody else caught that was Josie Wells. I love that post. Uh, <laughs> and so I want to hear your perspective and really kind of give you the floor as to what uh, what's going on with this case. But before we do that, for people who don't know anything about you and never heard of you, who is Jack Pitts, John Pitts? Uh, well, like any Gen Xer, um, I've got too many hats uh, because I, there's never one thing that kind of stays around very long so uh you know to start off in math and physics in college uh turn that into nuclear engineering with the u.s navy for five years which helped pay for college uh realized i didn't really want to be an engineer at least not the kind of engineer that runs around uh, running reactors and so uh, i loved finance from a young age was picking stocks at age 11. i think i bought my first stock with caddy money misabi trust it was a total uh horrible pick <laughs> so unlike most people uh what do they say like uh, beginners are lucky or whatever I, that was not me i i lost uh, you know a decent amount of money in my first ever uh purchase uh but i loved it i i loved it even before that uh my seventh grade teacher uh was doing stock picking contests Thought it was really cool. Uh, witnessed the 1987 crash live. In fact, that's why I bought my first stock. Uh, I bought it in right after that crash. And then, uh, what, what better time to buy a stock? Um, and then, um, always remembered that and was very always very business focused. Reading Wall Street Journal every day in college and Forbes and all that. And while I was in the Navy. Um, and then switched into finance. I was lucky enough to have a brother in finance and who had already made a name for himself. So I got in at roughly a, a slightly higher level than I would have uh, coming right out of the Navy. Now, Wall Street loves Navy guys. They especially love submarine guys. So I wouldn't have had any trouble getting a job, but uh, I was 28 at the time and ready to move fast because I felt like a lot of my life had been kind of wasted on something I didn't wasn't going to do forever in the Navy. And so uh, I was happy to take him up on uh, the offer. So I worked with him for about 10 years, uh, very successful. Um, some of the best years of my life, uh, picking stocks like Google and Apple before they were popular. If people can even believe that, that, that they weren't popular, but there were times when they weren't. Um, and then after about 10 years, went off on my own, did my own research uh, for kind of the family office, so to speak and uh but never took on uh outside money and uh ran into bitcoin via a very backwards way of trying to solve the puzzle in my spare time as to who satoshi was and uh, i thought it was nick zabo for a while uh i kind of stretched a few things to believe that but uh that was my best guess and then some weird tweet uh i think maybe preston burn somebody suggested reading the andrew o'hagan piece um and of course i read it because I, I had kind of dismissed craig wright entirely because everybody basically said he was a fraud and usually when there's that you know level of uh kind of uh, disgust it either it either means that there's something to it or there's nothing to it and it's easily dismissed and so when this person tweeted like hey read the andrew hagan piece i thought well uh it can't hurt to read it and if it's a good piece it'll help me eliminate him quicker and i won't ever have to think about him again so i read it it's a super long article like 16 pages i think he turned it into a, a chapter in his book it was so long 
but it was pretty helpful because although he comes to kind of the opposite conclusion in the end, um, like how could we have been, we have been fooled. Uh, I mean, he doesn't really say it, but that's kind of what he implies. Uh, I came to the complete opposite conclusion. I was like, that sounds exactly like the people that I've met along my path. And, you know, people like uh, Steve Case and uh, uh, Larry Page and, uh, you know, the, the founders of Expedia and GoTo.com and all these guys that I kind of met and, and kind of understood how their brain works and all that stuff from getting to quiz them and ask them questions. He just sounded like a founder to me. So, when you add it all up, I, I wasn't convinced, but I was like, this is, I'm going to have to go down and, and, and do some deeper work into what this guy is all about. And so I started consuming everything that he had. Now, back then there, there almost wasn't enough. I think I consumed everything in like three months, which was all of his blog posts, uh, everything I could find. And, uh, you know, I, I think by about two months later, I was something like 99% sure. And then the the thing that not only put me over the edge, but actually made me actually want to get into Bitcoin because I had avoided all this stuff on not not on purpose. Uh, I was very involved in payment uh, solutions for tech. I was an early owner of PayPal. Uh, I was one of the earliest owners of NetTeller, which was uh, ironically in the Calvin Air space of uh, gambling, online sports books and uh, poker during the poker craze of like the early zeros. So I was heavily, and, and by the way, NetTeller is a wallet, right? I mean, a perfect precursor to something like uh, Handcash or, uh, or Relija or one of those uh, wallets. So that was very familiar to me, the whole Bitcoin wallet space. So when I kind of watched this video, and I remember it was on Easter Sunday because my wife was telling me we had to go see her family. And I was like, just hold on, hold on, I just want to finish this video. I just had this aha moment as my my family was in the car, annoyed that I wasn't in there yet. And it was like a flash of not my genius, but somebody else's genius. And I was like, the one thing that I've been looking for to, to give any of this crypto stuff a chance was that money has to be backed by a, an asset. And, you know, if you look at Von Mises, he'll break money down into three things, which is asset-based money, which is what, what I'm talking about. Uh, then there's uh, kind of what I call IOU money, but basically is the kind of pre-1971 dollar where you can turn in the paper dollar for an equal amount of gold, $35. Well, originally it was 20, but uh, well, originally it was $1 gets you one silver coin uh, in the early days of America, but then it became $20 gets you one ounce of gold. And then they devalued it 40% in 1933 and it became $35 gets you an ounce of gold. And that, and that was true all the way through 71. And then 71, Nixon went off the gold standard, uh, not just in name, in name only, but completely. And we were on fiat. And fiat's the third kind of, uh, I call it faith-based money to kind of relate it to, I don't know. I, I think faith is kind of an okay thing, but um, I don't want it in my money or my finance. <laughs> I don't operate on faith. I operate on, you know, basically knowing that I'm going to win if I make a bet, kind of. So uh, fiat is no good. It, it, it doesn't last very long. Uh, IOU money can last as long as you trust the other party, which would be like something like the Fed or the national banking system or the United States Mint system at the time. And uh and that'll last longer. But the thing that lasts the longest is just good old fashioned hard commoditized money, a silver coin, a, a copper penny, a barrel of oil. Go ahead. So beads, uh, shiny cylindrical clamshells that you can use as like armor that the Native Americans use as armor and also the ladies uh, would would uh, put their hair in the, in the hole that goes through it. Uh, that's actually money, uh, legit, totally legit money uh, for 30 years uh, during the uh, 17th century when there wasn't a lot of gold and silver around. So many different things can be money, but the things that are assets last the longest and people trust it the most because if there's ever any kind of doubt, there is no doubt because you can just use the money for what it's supposed to be used for, right? So the beads can be used as armor or to do your hair. 
or many other things. Uh, the silver can obviously be melted down, turned into circuits or China or whatever you want to use it for uh, silverware. Uh, so that's the idea of money is it's the most common asset that's used in trade as the denominator to trade. And that's throughout history. It's always been what money has been based on. It, it first was grain based, which is where we get the name grains for something like silver and gold. Then it became silver and gold, thanks to King Croesus and the uh, Macedonian Empire and the Roman Empire. And that continued all the way until, well, uh, there's many periods of fiat. So I don't want to say it continued all the way until 1971. But uh, right now, for all practical purposes, since uh, almost nobody remembers money based on anything else other than fiat or, or broken promises, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's probably relevant to just state it simply that we've been on hard money a long time. And now we've gone to this really long 50 year period of being on money that's backed by nothing. And so what Craig said in this video, and I really wish I could tell you which video it was, uh, but it certainly existed before April 2019, is he, he said the key word for me, which was commodity. Now, we've seen this many times, probably since then, but back then it was like, I remember after I heard that video, I kept waiting for him to say it again, and it took like a year, a year and a half for him even to mention it again. And so, uh, and I feel like I was almost a little bit part of that because I wrote a, a really uh, long article on money and kind of finished it off with Bitcoin and tied the two together that Bitcoin really is a hard-based money. And it basically what it is is, money that's based on, uh, I call it a computational commodity, right? And I think Craig probably says it better than, than that. Um, maybe not back then, but uh, lately he calls it an informational commodity. And I 100% agree with that. That's probably more accurate than computational commodity, which is almost a subset of informational commodity. And so I think that's what Bitcoin really is. And I'm, I'm super happy about that because during this very court case, you're hearing a lot of stuff about Timecoin. And one of my biggest problems with Bitcoin and maybe even Craig himself, and, and maybe the only area I disagree with him, is sort of on this money concept of what money is. Because, you know, Craig's very uh, pedantic and he will say, um, well, you know, Von Mises is the definition of money, right? So he'll say, you know, if I say money, he'll say, well, you know, which classification? Do you mean IOU money? Do you mean hard asset backed money? Do you mean fiat? Because he considers all those money. Well, I run a dictionary, right? So I can I can identify with his pedanticism on, on money. But I would say to him, uh, money's derived from monetas, which is a temple in, I think, Mycenaean Greece, uh, or, or is it Rome? But either way, it was a mint. It's literally, I think it's Rome. It's literally where the, the Romans minted their silver denarius, which is the name of one of Craig's companies, by the way. And the denarius uh, basically became the word money through monetas, which is the name of, I think, the goddess of the temple in which they minted the money. So, and that's super important too, right? Because monetas relates not just to the coin itself but to the mint system and that is exactly what bitcoin is bitcoin and people in fact people get confused and they, they're trying to all the time Im implement this well if it's a capital b it means the system and if it's a little b it means the coin and i can kind of identify with that um so money is the system or commodity commoditized asset that is the rules that you follow to participate in this commerce thing where you trade back and forth. So barters, you can trade anything you want. Anything can be the new, the denominator in trade. You wanna buy a car, you can pay in horses if you like, or you can pay in oil. Whatever the person will take is what you can do. That's barter. But when most of the transactions in an economy are the same denominator, horses, I buy it with silver coins. Car, I'd buy it with silver coins. Stocks, I buy it with silver coins. Coffee, silver coin. Once you have that denominator that's the most common asset or commodity, to be more specific, commodity that's the most common denominator in trade, that by definition is the definition of money. 
And so once I saw Craig talk about this in sort of a roundabout, very unclear way, it was enough for me because I was already looking for it. I was waiting for some payment company or some inventor of new money to actually say such a thing because up until then, I believed that we were just going to go back to silver and gold again, right? Because this fiat thing doesn't last very long. That's already true. We've already lost 98% of the purchasing power of the dollar in my lifetime since 1971, and that's going to go to 100% at some point. And when we reset, I just suspected that we would reset to silver or gold again. So it turns out that what gave me the chill that day in April 2019 was that this Bitcoin thing could be a commodity that's not silver or gold based, but it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more secure, and it's going to be more broadly distributed than silver and gold money. And, and there's almost an unlimited supply. Now, granted, it's a bounded supply, but 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis is plenty. Believe me, you, you could stick all the currencies in the world on probably less than 5% of Bitcoin. And it would totally work out and it would be hard backed. And so, man, we're getting to a lot of stuff really quick. Yeah. But what, I would, what I would say is that is kind of topical right now is everybody's worried about the central bank digital currency. And I totally respect that because if all we do is say, well, here's a hundred dollar bill sitting on one Satoshi. Well, then the hundred dollar bill is not backed by anything, right? You can't melt that down and turn it into uh, a dollar's worth of purchasing power. You're only gonna get a little Satoshi out of that. And that generally probably isn't gonna equal much. Maybe you're lucky if it, it becomes a penny someday. But if you back the dollar with, let's say a hundred B, Satoshis in BSV or a thousand or 10,000, well then anytime you lose confidence in the American dollar, for instance, if I can press a button, melt the American dollar back into its BSV or a Bitcoin, then it has value because the commodity trades separate from money, right? So now you have a, a check and a balance by the people, people power, right? So now you have this check and balance by the market of people who decide what the price of this money is. And voila, that's what gold and silver were doing, right? Like, you know, gold and silver, sure, it was tied to the dollar, but it really kind of traded freely. That's how we got off of the dollar because the Britain, uh, British actually let it float and uh, silver and gold kind of took off and then the United States was screwed. And that's what caused Nixon to go off of the dollar standard. It was, it was London opening up and letting it trade freely for the first time in a while. That's what caused America to have to, to move or they were gonna lose all their silver and gold. So this is a very important concept in central bank digital currency and so what I would say to people is, instead of being afraid of central bank digital currency, uh, just work hard to make sure that your country does it right. Because if, a, let's say the United States does a fiat version of, 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 of uh, the US dollar on BSV, but say Iceland says the hell of that, we're gonna back every Icelandic krona with a thousand Satoshis that you can melt down if you feel that you know we're overprinting or whatever we're doing as a government that's bad, well then people are gonna start using the Icelandic Krona, right? Because that, that, that has trust. And so uh, on the one hand, I understand people's fear of central bank digital currency, but on the other hand, history has proved that the commodity itself in raw form with no rules and no government backing doesn't last very long. So it's gonna turn out uh, that probably in 200 years, I'll, I'll give it as much time as I can think of to be conservative, but in 200 years, there won't really be a lot of trading of money that's just BSV. BSV will be thought of as an informational commodity and the empty BSV that don't have uh, time stamps and time coin like things inside of it, that will be known as kind of like gold bars or silver coins, right? They're, they're not being used for any particular purpose at the moment, but they can function as kind of a commoditized money and it, they'll melt down into various central bank digital currencies. So long story short, I got into Bitcoin because I actually believe in it, which I didn't prior to 2019. Thank you, Jack. I mean, sounds like a, a beautiful, you know, you painted a beautiful picture there from the beginning of the early days where you got in as a stock trader, you started in the Navy to then all the way how you got into Bitcoin and then the entire story of money. So, and you briefly touched on 
on this on this Satoshi trial. And uh, my question for you is: It, it looks like you ha- were on a quest and driven to identify who Satoshi actually was. And my, you know, what is it that motivated you? Why should people care? Because there's so many people say, "Oh, it doesn't matter." Why should people care? Clearly, you were motivated to find out who he was. What was the what was it that drove you? Uh, sheer hobby, actually. Uh, I've read Killing Pablo, where they couldn't find Pablo uh, Escobar. Um, I, I I think this whole trend of being pseudonymous and everything was a little bit newer to me at the time, and I realized that it was kind of associated with the internet. And now it's crazy. It's almost like if you're a real person, it's a detrimental to your marketing ability and everything. You're much better off being, you know, Unwriter or Satoshi Nakamoto, the the Australian or whatever. Like, you, you know, we've seen this where the marketing almost works better if you're not a real person. But um, to me, that's a, a little bit annoying and not just annoying. It makes me distrust uh, people in the way that uh, actually Craig kind of talks about an- anonymity. Like when you go that far, you get into the Invisible Man and the Ring of Gyges and all that. And and those stories are about if you can get away with everything uh, because you're invisible or whatever, you know, you know what kind of atrocities will you commit? Um, and there's a whole other story to that where I think it's Plato or, or Aristotle says something like, well, no, I, I think you still it depends on the man, right? If, if you have all that power or what does Spider-Man's father say? With great uh, power comes great responsibility. So I, I think that's actually the, the right answer. But that said, um, a lot of people with that anonymity is a hiding place for for this, for not just criminality. That would be the wrong word for it, I think, because a lot of things are criminal that maybe shouldn't be like, uh, you know, smoking pot or whatever. Uh, who knows? Um but there are certain things that I think we all agree are are real crime. Like, you know, anybody do anything against your kids uh, just because you look the other way for a half a second? I mean, that's every parent's worst nightmare. So there are certain things that are just universally recognized as high crime. And uh, so I think that's kind of maybe where I differ is I, I probably would have eight years ago called myself a ANCAP or a uh, in fact, I did call myself an AMCAP. I used to have a shirt that says, uh, there's no government like no government. <laughs> it was my favorite t-shirt. But uh, it's it's ironic that it is Craig uh, that actually kind of changed my view on that. Now, I'm not, as, uh, I'm not as cheerleader as he is where I think that I can, with civics, change the world. But uh, I think there's other ways. Uh, but they also those other ways also like him do not involve uh, violent means or revolution or anarchy. So I, you know, I, I think he's got a great point, which is once you go the anarchy route, you no longer believe in property rights. And uh, you know, I, I can identify with that, and, and maybe there's a world where that can be like that, but it's it's a very different world than what we have today. And I don't think we're anywhere close to going that route. So, so why bother talking about it unless you just really want to kill people and commit crimes? So I, I may be a little bit different there. But I guess what I would say is this trial, I think, is has two kind of huge major themes, one of which is along that lines, which is uh, BTC really is a crime coin. Um, Lightning Network uh, works almost the same as... Um, tornado cash which the government took down as fast as they could and uh it's not the right system and the other kind of major theme that that kind of uh makes this trial amazing is this whole identity uh process and uh, i think that's the coolest thing to talk about with this trial and it's something nobody's really talking about which is everybody the judge the people at the court, you, me, everybody who owns some BSV, everybody who runs a business on BSV and is starving for capital. We all want them just to sign or do some like amazing revelation, like, whoa, it was all a dream, you know, and now I'm just going to come and, and boom, uh, steganography and boom, I'm just going to hit you all at once with these, oh my God, there's no way he could have done that without being Satoshi. And I do think he can do those things. I really do. 
Maybe not all the ones we talk about, but there's some that are pretty obvious I think he can do. But it's wrong. It's the wrong way to go about it because I think we're entering this era and we're already in this era of, of, of coding and technology is everything. I mean, chat GPT can talk for us now. We don't have to write our own articles. And if you really know how chat GPT works, and I think we're started, that's starting to come out after a year and a half of like pure bliss, um, it's sort of an averaging mechanism, right? And so you're not really, it's not that AI is coming up with a new formula to beat Einstein. It's just kind of repeating the average, what the average physicist says. And that's not how information grows, right? Information grows by the weirdos, right? What's that Stephen, Steve Jobs commercial? Like, uh, only the crate here's to the crazy ones like the the round pegs in the square holes these are the weirdos that push information forward that don't abide by the rules and they do weird stuff and they're the people look at them like they're nuts i mean they locked up galileo for instance uh because he didn't have the same viewpoint as them on on how the universe works and so this concept is really obnoxious right now. I mean, you have five companies, which are most of which I've already invested in at some point in my life, some some of which for very long periods of time, your, your Googles and your Apples. Um, they've they've become so dominant that we almost forget that we're people, right? Like that you can make your own food or instead of ordering it on on Amazon, having it delivered. So it's like, you know, technology does not solve everything. And uh, I'm a guy who 20 years ago was pushing for technology to do all this new stuff and people were resisting like, no, I still like my travel agent. I just want to call her up and have her do everything for me. And it's like, no, no, no. Like you can see everything. You can see all the flights yourself. Just go on Expedia. And, uh, and now I find myself doing the opposite. Like I have to remind people that, uh, you know, code is not going to solve every problem and there's no better example than Bitcoin, right? Like the, the number one, or maybe it's not number one, but it's in the top five unsolved problems in computer science is the Byzantine generals uh, prob problem. And it was solved not with code. And that's why it wasn't solved for so long. And some people still think it's not solved, but it is. It's solved by this, this work concept or your, your reputation or your, your, the work that you're doing and continue to do is the reason why people like and trust you. And this this is very common in sociology, but in in the tech com computer, especially the computer science world, they don't even recognize it as a solution. It's like, ah, well, that can't work. Like, how could that possibly work? It's a, it's it's, a, it's feely, touchy feely. And so Bitcoin sort of combines that. Well, it's not totally touchy feely because you have to solve this puzzle and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, it's this marriage of, OK, the code's doing some stuff. But really, it's just the fact that you have this ginormous server farm and everybody knows you have invested three billion in it. And why would you want to cheat someone out of a million bucks when you've invested three billion, right? Your three billion is earning you, you know, hopefully uh, half a half a billion a year. So if you screw up and you cheat or you double spend or you allow double spending, well, you, you fried your investment because no one will trust you. And everybody in the banking world, well, maybe not anymore, but everybody in the old banking world would have understood this, right? This is why every bank is called trust. Uh, you know, there, there's trust is probably the most common word in every banking name. And the reason is because the bank has nothing without trust. And so I think that concept, which pervades uh, Bitcoin, uh, involves knowing when to trust someone and when you trust them is when they've done all this work for you because it's hard to go back on that and I think uh, that concept inside of this trial really brings you to that do you believe that Craig is Satoshi because he signed something and then the the world cabal who has all way more money than you do or because they don't like that and it's against how they're making money they're just going to invent a a doubt which is what they're already doing right everything he says or does it's like no we can explain that you're a forger and and, and they take it into this really dark place where you, you don't even acknowledge what's right in front of your face which is how could this man sit in court all day long 
talk technology that's two octaves above my level, and I got a pretty decently high level. Uh, he knows everything about forensics, and yet we're supposed to believe he doesn't, you know, forge documents very well, or he forges documents like a fifth grader. Um, and that's like this weird contrast in this trial that we see every single day. It's like, oh, well, you forged these documents like an idiot. Well, now I'm telling you like all this other highly technical stuff about forensics, which is all totally correct. And yet I'm really bad at forging. And so you have this like, oh, well, you just have to sign. You have to do something to, to prove it to us with technology. Steganography. Look at what everybody's asking for. Steganography. Uh, move coins. Um, what's the third one? Oh, uh, uh, PGP key. Where's your PGP key? And all the nerds, that's all they th can think about. It's like, well, you, you can't prove. And, and meanwhile, I live in an era where everybody got a fake ID. And how did you do it? You got some other guy's birth certificate. You brought it into a federal office where you could probably be charged with a felony as a 16 year old. They probably wouldn't do it, which is why everybody probably did it, because they knew that the penalty wouldn't be so harsh. But everybody went in and, and committed this major, including myself, went in. 16 years old, got myself a fake, fake ID. ID, huh, Jack? Oh, yeah. Like, I'll admit it. Yeah, put me in jail now. Uh, it got taken away pretty quickly, so I didn't get too much damage done. But the point is, like, that document didn't mean shit, right? It was a piece of paper. If I showed you what my documentation was in 1996 when I got a fake ID, everybody would laugh. Like, I was one of... Like, I consider it modern that I was one of the first people with a driver's license with my picture on it. My brother, well, I don't want to out him either, but when people of my brother's age doctored their stuff to get a fake ID, they just used a pen. <laughs> it wasn't laminated. There was no picture. You, I'm, I have to laugh every time I see, like, you know, the Copas pointing out that the nine font doesn't match the other font. And I'm like... Yeah, imagine, <laughs> imagine the forgeries that I saw when I was like 11 and I'm watching 18 year olds with a pen, write it, turn a, a zero into a nine. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like one, five, three, and then like it is ginormous nine. <laughs> right there on a fake ID. <laughs> yeah, 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 right there. And so it's like, I, I'm just thinking, Okay, so he signed, he moves coins. Well, he just killed Dave Kleiman or, or, or LaRue or whoever you want to believe it was. I'm sorry, but that doesn't prove, not only does that not prove anything, but we're seeing in the case that nothing he does, nothing. They won't even budge one inch on anything. Nothing that he does is legitimate. This whole man's life has been ruined by people picking apart i had a guy he's a super smart dude and uh very well experienced in tech and he told me none of craig's uh certifications is GAC or sssrn none of those are real because you could just have someone take those tests for you and i'm like you are aware that a um, one of those tests, which is at the highest level, um, which, by the way, I think he got when he was like writing the white paper or at least submitting it, that test, some of it's live, right? There's only three people that had it <laughs> as of like 2009. They actually, so little people went for it, they just shut it down. I think it was too hard. Now, probably because people were like cheating on the test and you had to perform live. I don't know. But he has that and it's not like he doesn't back it up right he's got books and it's not like you ask him they're asking him in the case about some of the stuff in these books and he's, he's like practically quoting it and even when he's not quoting he's giving you the details and they cut him off because they don't want him to talk tech because it does make him look smart and so it's like they're ruining this guy's life like like they won't let him have one victory in anything like can we at least agree that this certification was legitimately gotten no you're a fraud you forged that you forged all your money all the money you made when you were a younger man in it security that was all forged uh you were working with online gambling that's shady as hell the ato uh, 
ATO, yeah. you, yeah. you were applying for grants? Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> and by the way, one of these grants, the biggest one that everybody claims that he uh, was trying to get free money on, I think it was like 57 million. Uh, it wasn't a grant. It was repatriatization of his Bitcoin that was sitting in Panama. And he's like, hey, and this is how he's financing his companies, by the way, right? Like the reason his first wife is probably angry with him in 2011 is because he just blew a ton of his nut or his fa savings, as we call it, uh, his family kind of savings nut on computer equipment, right? He's running tests and all this other stuff. I mean, he's running his own test server, all that stuff. And, and trying to like prove uh, scale while, when there's nobody even around. It's like a, Bitcoin's a ghost town, but here's Craig with like 20 or whatever, 69 computers, like running tests like he's doing now, but there's no engine. It's just him, right? And he's not the world's best probably manager at that time. Uh, probably do a better job today, but like back then, young guy, right? His 30s, doesn't run in startups with all these people they don't know what to do with these He's not able to handle emotional issues, and that's what companies are all about. He's got 50 people running around telling him about their, their cat's dead that day or whatever. <laughs> and, he, and he's trying to do all this stuff. And then, like, boom, someone, you know, things go wrong, right? So he, <laughs> he runs out of money. Uh, he, he, applies, he tries to save his company by applying for this grant and, and repatriate, repatriating his, his, his Bitcoin to fund his company. And what does the ATO do? They approve it, right? And then this is right about the time where IRA Climate comes along. And, and it has this work, right? It's just like Apple trying to repatriate all their uh, Irish money, right? Apple does this every day. They're like, hey, government, US government, will you let us, you want us to invest in America, let us repatriate our money without paying any taxes on it, right? The US government, I think to this day has said no. So the money just sits in Ireland, right? And they don't know what to do with it because they don't want to invest in Ireland, they want to invest in the United States. Okay, so Craig does the same thing. And the deal is, let's say you bring in, uh, let's say the tax rate in, in, in Australia is 10% or something, right? Capital gains. So he wants to bring in $570 million, which is completely finance his company. And in exchange, he doesn't want to pay the 10%. So that's 57 million. And so that's the 57 million. It's not that he's getting 57 million from the ATO where they're going like to write him a check, which is what all these like uh, BTC people think. Like, oh, the guy's just a fraudster. He made all of his money by government grants. You know, he's just stealing money from the uh, ATO. No, it was a, it was a damn uh, tax rebate, right? So uh, that's what he wanted to do. And it was approved. And then suddenly it was not approved. Okay, now why did that happen? Well, Dave Kleiman died. Ira Kleiman takes over, starts asking him, sh shaking down Craig, finds out that he's Satoshi. He's like, hey man, uh, you know, time to pay the piper. I own 50% of this weird company you started with Dave, which by the way, totally failed. Uh, you know, give me some money. <laughs> Craig's like, that's not how it works, bro. It's like it's like me at Slictionary, right? Like, it'd be like somebody asking me, uh, well, I own 10% of Slictionary, and uh, it was, you know, it's it, you're Satoshi, so that should be worth 10 million. Why don't you just ship me 10 million? I'm like, that's not how it works, buddy. Uh, we're a tiny startup, you know, we're, we're, we're scraping by like everybody else. That's not how it works. So Craig tells him that. And right about that point, other people arrive to help Mr. Ira. And it's like, well, Jamie... Wilson at in formerly of uh, Craig's employee, or maybe even at the time was one of Craig's employee, a little bit disgruntled, uh, starts helping Ira out, starts uh, kind of sympathizing with him. Then uh, maybe Ira goes out and looks for a Bitcoin expert. Maybe he runs into Greg Maxwell. Who else would you run into on Reddit if you uh, looked around and asked, hey, who's a Bitcoin expert? Oh, it's probably Greg. Now you've invited the wolves into the hen house, right? So what happens? Voila, by, two th by September 8th, 2014, Satoshi is hacked. Not Craig, Satoshi. Now everybody knows this, it's a longtime Bitcoiner. Now I had to learn it later, but if Kurt was around in 2014 or people that are around longer or Daniel Krawitz or something, they all remember that, right? It was like, Nobody argues this point, right? You won't see Copa saying, well, no, Satoshi, Satoshi, the great security guy, 
was hacked. But Craig's not allowed to be a great security guy and get hacked ever. No, that would never happen, right? Like hmm. no NASCAR driver has ever been involved in a regular old auto accident in America. That would never happen because he's an expert at driving. So this hack happens. And in the climbing case, we get proof of it, right? The RCJBR email. And it turns out that one of the charges in climbing was that Craig's a fraud. And he was cleared of that charge mainly on the back of the fact that during the case, uh, Vel Friedman and crew and Kyle Roach relied on this document that kind of tied Craig to Dave. And Craig pointed out like that is, that's a forgery. That's an obvious forgery. And you don't need any metadata to figure out because those are the initials of my family. And I didn't have that family in 2009, which is the date on that email. And so that was the turning point in climbing, right? Uh, I think they've erased it, which is also really shady, but like uh, Craig's counsel, who didn't seem to really like Craig very much, I guess when you're in court long enough with him, you tend to not like him, but uh, he said like the case was unwinnable, but he said that was the turning point. Uh, there's a podcast somewhere on this. Everybody should really try and find that or ask the people who own it. Uh, you can find a hint of the podcast, but for some reason it's hard to play or you, or they may have even taken it down. I'm not sure. There's still a link up on that podcast, but it's with uh, Andres Rivero. And uh, you, you look Google for it and you'll find one of the podcasts he's on that talks about uh, the, 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 uh, the Craig Wright case. I'll find it and I'll put it here in this video on a card. Everybody can watch it. I don't, it's, I don't think it's watchable. I think it's audio and you may, and they may have taken it down for, obvious reasons because people like me are using it uh to show people that craig is not the forger okay so everybody in the jury learned that in that trial but here we are in the same exact trial with the same exact charges of forgery and this very day we learned that the same exact thing happened and that's why i'm laughing today because there's people running around going oh they finally nailed craig on the forgery <laughs> Uh, and I'd have to go in to explain what happened today, but basically they let him down this road and are like, you know, this would definitely be forgery if, if this happened. He's like, yeah, definitely. And uh, there's this like gotcha moment where he's like, well, what is this document? And he's like, these are your submitted uh, Bitcoin white paper files. And he's like, all of them? He's like, and, he, and they're like, all of them. I think they're like, the the guy gunning is practically high-fiving. Yeah. Uh, like looking around. Like, Woo! Yeah, his staff in the back won. were all celebrating. Where he just won the trial. And very calmly and silently, Craig just goes, well, if that were the case, and I indeed forged these documents, then the logs that you have so uh, usefully beaten me with and all these other charges of forgery would have had the timestamps for those forgeries. So where are they? No answer. Silence. Now, in a movie or a TV show, that would have been like the Matlock moment, right? Where you're like, oh my God, they tried to nail him and he turned the mirror on him. And it, you know, what's that expression? Uh, uh, I'm rubber, you're glue, everything you say against me sticks to you. <laughs> yeah. They're like, forger, 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 forger. And he just puts the, the, the rubber up and it bounces off and it sticks to them because how did that forgery happen? Well, it turns out we, we kind of know. Uh, and, and so the second thing he said was he goes, oh, remember when I reminded you like several days ago, also via your evidence, not mine, that you tried to pin me with that picture of my laptop screen. And on the, I remember this day because it was right before the trial and it was like the day of or the day after the trial or maybe the first, second or day. And all of a sudden all over Twitter was, oh my God, look, Craig, has we have a picture of Craig forging the Dennis Mayaka? What I forget what they call him by his email name, like Mamima Sheba or something. I forget what it is. He's got a weird email address, uh, and they keep referring to this, right? And 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 the first people the internet said, what which was they had to back off from, was they go, oh look, it's Craig is Dennis Mayaka. Like he's forging, he's pretending to be this guy in the sequels, but it's really just Craig Lattice scribbling away in his little dark closet, his dark forgery closet. Where yeah, the they seem to think that Dennis Mayaka is a fake person. He's not even an attorney. They did. 
They, yeah. they don't say that anymore, notice. Nobody's <laughs> charging that anymore. They had to back off from that one because it looked like it was Craig, right? Because in the little picture, like where your Chrome browser sits on the bottom, there was like a little picture of one of the normal Craig headshots. And it was like, it was there to show that this is Craig cheating or forging, right? <laughs> and the funny thing is, during the, I don't know if it was before the trial, it probably happened in the witness statements, and that's why they backed off. Um, in probably the witness statements, Craig was like, you idiots, um, that's a Linux system. <laughs> I don't have a Linux system. I use Windows. Like, all you have to do is look at the top right symbol, that's Linux. And that whole thing was kind of shot down, or at least them trying to think that he was Dennis Mayaka. So like, but the funny thing is, he then just points out on like day four of the trial, he's like, well, who would have a Linux? Well, hackers love Linux. And, oh, uh, there's like 10 people at Enchain that can verify that a bunch of hoodlums came in that were supposedly, you know, employees of Enchain for the day. <laughs> Uh, that said, by authority of Christian Auger Hansen, we're removing you from the server room. And next thing you know, there was a system-wide update for everybody's computer, and a Trojan horse was inserted onto the uh, notebook computers of everybody at Enchain. And who, that's why they could see what Stefan was doing and what everybody was emailing Calvin and all this stuff that Christian Auger Hansen brought out. How did he get it? How did he get this photo of this Dennis Mayaka information. It only well, could like, come... uh, you know, the Stefan Matthews had testified that, uh, that Edgar Hansen did break into the end chain office while he was CEO. I mean, he was there and, and he had another gentleman with him and they, and a, and a security detail. And then they, they kicked everyone out and did God knows what after that. Uh, and then he was fired after that. That was the turning point. So yeah, that's, that's not come out. It seems to be majorly problematic. And then there's injunctions against Christian Ager Hansen as well that, yeah, uh, you know, hopefully that you know, we'll see this court should be taking notice of those injunctions that these are actual problems. Well, see now, if, if you suspect now I, I got chickens, right? Uh, I don't have them. It's my son. It's a big chicken lover. Uh, his definition of chicken is on uh, Slictionary. The audio is awesome. You should check it out. But anyway, he's really into chickens. My wife is into it too. And we have wolf and hawk problems. So my son and I handle it differently. I get the shotgun out and I get really quiet and I try and go out and catch the fox in the action. Now, the problem is if I do it that way, I could lose a chicken, right? And he, that's not something he's going to allow, right? So when he goes out, even though he's got a little BB gun or something, uh, and I tell him, look, if you run out there like a dingbat out of hell, the foxes are not dumb. They're going to be like three miles away by the time you get anywhere near them with that BB gun. So you got no chance. You got to be quiet and you have to be willing to, to sacrifice a chicken so that he doesn't get all the chickens. So <laughs> there's this concept of, to catch people in the act of crime, you've got to let them do it. You know what I mean? Like, it, how are you going to blame the fox? Because you don't know whether he was the guy that killed the last three chickens. But if he's back again, you can be damn well sure that he was the guy who killed the last three chickens because here he is with a, with a damn chicken in his mouth. <laughs> he's trying to leave, right? So this is the way this trial has been conducted. And I, I normally wouldn't say this because I wouldn't want to kind of give it away because I realized that Craig was doing this back in like the climbing trial, but like this is kind of part of the strategy. It's like, why is Craig so weak? How come we don't know? How come we haven't seen Craig's documents? Copa puts them out. We can see all their skeletal arguments. We can see everything Copa puts out. We don't see anything Craig puts out, right? And there's a reason for that. The reason is you can win a trial much more easily by catching people in the act of doing stupid stuff that becomes the gotcha moment, right? And it kills two birds with one stone. It not only becomes the gotcha moment to prove what you're trying to prove, but it also gets them in trouble, right? So it's like, it's not enough to prove that the fox was the person stealing the chicken. I'm getting the fox who's stealing the chicken and now the whole world knows it, right? So it's like, okay, everybody's like, oh, Craig, why will you not just sign and be Satoshi and prove it? Well, it's not enough. It's also part of it to be like, well, some people need to pay, 
a little bit, right? Because these people wouldn't even let me have an inch. They wouldn't even agree that I had a certification. They told me my degrees were baloney. They ruined my career. They ruined my career reputation. This is the answer to the four biggest questions in Bitcoin. Biggest question in Bitcoin. Why was Satoshi Nakamoto anonymous? Why do you think? Well, uh, the main reason the Satoshi was likely anonymous was the, I would say, the fear of his reputation in, in his current profession. Uh, BDO, I think it was, he had a business profession and a as a CFO or whatever he was doing, a C, you know, C, CIO at the time. He didn't want to become a, you know, an You're idiot. Smart man, you nailed it. You totally nailed it. I would even put math behind it. At the time of 2000, well, I'm going to put math to it in the second question, but there's actual math you can do that's any idiot can, can say that's obvious, okay? So yes, he had a professor, he talks about it during this trial, and they're like, no, 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 the professor, you couldn't have had him because he was gone, and Craig's like, I had him as undergrad, and there's like this big controversy, whether he even talked to this professor. The professor doesn't remember anything, so it looks really bad. But basically, the professor tells him like, hey, man, if you put your name on this stuff, it's going to ruin your career, right? Like, like Sean Fanning did the music thing with uh, Napster and, and I'm, I'm, you know, he made a few bucks with it, I'm sure somehow, but like, it's risky, right? You're ruining all the work you put into being a security professional and a forensics expert. And you're at the top of your game, making six figures at probably actually seven figures for Craig at, at that time. And he's going to blow it all uh, over a few hundred thousand. Well, anyway, so second question. Because I don't want to, I don't want to give you the math for free. Uh, why did why did Satoshi leave Bitcoin in two thousand? Satoshi leave Bitcoin. Well, it seems like um, oh, that's a why did he actually leave? What was the motive to leave Bitcoin? Uh, seems like he was driven out. That appears appears to be the narrative that he was literally, uh, you know, he's testified that he's basically just been completely uh, had other things going on you know that's actually that's a good question jack partially was, but, but the number one thing he says is he was disenfranchised with bitcoin thought he had failed because what was bitcoin being used for most often oh in the first business was a heroin business that was the whole thing and that silk he road. said yeah silk road which by, the way, which by the way he's alluded to in this trial that marty malmy and famous michael markhart were basically uh helping uh, program Silk Road. And oh, by the way, there's a Mark Carpellis, which is Mount Gox. It's always an inside job. Uh, Mark Carpellis is involved with Marty Malmy, who hosted Bitcoin.org uh, or was it? No, it was the, the Bitcoin Talk Forum. Bitcoin Talk Forum hosting got paid for by Mark Carpellis. Yeah, that, that, Marty Marty Melmy testified. He brought up Mark Carpellis in his testimony. Yes, because when they were talking about the three forms of the Bitcoin Talk Forum, there was first SourceForge, which is like a free, uh, it's like a free uh, cruddy version of chat or not chat, but you know forum. And they were like, that's no good. So they used Bitcoin.org. And uh, they had a Bitcoin.org forum that they, I don't know if they built it. It's probably they got scrapware or, or name uh, white label stuff, or I don't know how they did the Bitcoin forum, but it was on Bitcoin.org. Then they moved it to Bitcoin Talk, which Satoshi did not own that URL, right? So they, they went from SourceForge, where Craig has the PGP key. Then they went to Bitcoin.org where Craig owns the URL. He like he literally bought the, you know, bitcoin.org in August 2008. And it's uh, oh, it's another oh, we'll just produce the credit card in, in your Satoshi moment. But I I don't No, it's another forgery. That's what they're alleging. Yeah, so that's a Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they moved it to bitcointalk.org or net and and that was a uh, URL that Mark Carpellis had donated for free to do the hosting for free to Marty Malmy. Malmy so, testified there that he, he, Satoshi didn't have access. He just never asked, but then he couldn't get the archives of his old messages. He, he tried to get him, but he couldn't get him before his testimony. And, you know, and uh, you know, he, he, they might've been in there, but he, he just couldn't find the old archive messages from Satoshi requesting access. Yeah. But if he asked, I'd give it to him. It's like, 
Gavin, I'm going to build you a personalized uh, forum for your show. What do you think? Well, uh, will I get access? No, no, I'm not going to give you access. <laughs> Everybody, we're all talk about the Gavin show. But I'm just going to conveniently forget to invite you oh. on your own forum. Oh, just say I never asked. Yeah, you never asked. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, it's total, talk about being unbelievable, right? Yeah. Imagine that was the other way around. Kobo would make the biggest deal of that. Like, oh, right, Craig, you didn't invite Satoshi. We're supposed to believe that you didn't invite the guy who invented it. If 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 Lord Grabner was like the little uh, little Weasley guy, what's his name? Um, the dude who was on there today. Um, Hoff. There's Hoff and Orr. Mr. Orr. Dunning. Mr. Hoff. Oh, Dunning. Yeah. If he was like Gunning, they would have had a field day with that answer, right? They would have turned into a big drama in the courtroom. Uh, and, then, you know, you looked at the judge with those big brown eyes like, you see this judge is trying to say they made a top bit time talk for him and they didn't invite Satoshi because he didn't ask. Get the hell out of here. Come on. <laughs> did, not only did he, he didn't ask, but he admitted that, oh, by the way, well, what about all the archived messages? Do you have the message? Oh, I just have one. What about the others? Oh, I couldn't find those. I couldn't <laughs> get them in time. I Famos couldn't get them those. in time? Famos has those. Yeah. Fam oh, someone else has them. Famos has them. Yeah. Excuse well, me. Well, the reason why Famos can't testify is because everybody knows that he was a tyrant on the Reddit or whatever, right? So even the people that are with BTC are like, oh, God, well, we can't let Famos talk because he's his nut job, right? Like, he's a dictator. It's like letting – it would be like uh, trying to have Greenpeace be represented by Stalin or something. <laughs> like, Stalin might be for Greenpeace, but we really don't want him to be our spokesmodel at this court case, you know? So – that's all kind of weird and dirty that nobody talks about uh, at the moment. But but those were big zingers during the trial. Um, now, where, where's where's Mr. Maxwell been this whole trial? His name keeps coming up, but again, you know where you where's he? <laughs> again, if you're trying to give Germany a good name, you don't put Hitler on the trial, on the witness stand. You know what I'm saying? He's part of the history, but you don't put him on the stand. And His like, name has been brought up more you know, than beer and mountains and, and beautiful women. Yeah, it seems like that name has been brought up more than any other name in the trial, uh, Matt, Mr. Maxwell. And who is this? No, because it would be perjury fest. <laughs> Instead of Oktoberfest, we'd have perjury fest. <laughs> if Greg Maxwell were on that stand, holy mackerel, it'd be, it'd be a whole different ballgame. But let's go back to this. So Craig has said numerous times, sure, there was stuff going on in his personal life that was a problem, that was going to take up time. He had a divorce going, all that stuff. But the biggest reason was he was embarrassed. It'd be like, you know, you know the story of the Nobel Prize, right? The reason Nobel created the prize because he invented dynamite. And the first thing they did with it was like, awesome, let's kill people in the wars, right? We're gonna kill everyone with this thing. And so he was so embarrassed as an inventor, he, he probably was thinking, oh, well, we can blast through mountains so the trains don't have to go over the pass, which nobody remembers, that was a big deal. That's how a lot of people would die is going over the mountain pass where it's snowing and everything. And uh, he didn't realize it. So he, he created the Nobel Prize to kind of like give himself a better name. Well, this is what Craig felt, right? He's like a minister. He's like gone down to South America for a few months to battle uh, kitty trafficking and high crime down there. Didn't want any parts of it. And he's like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't create Bitcoin so that Mark Carpellis, Greg Maxwell, Christian Auger Hansen, uh, uh, Ross Ulbricht, who's in serving four life terms because he uh, he told an, a CIA agent that it was okay if he just gives him a, uh, some money to kill someone who was going to turn him in, which people don't like to talk about. Free Ross, but Free Ross was trying to kill someone. Uh, that's why he's in prison. He's not in prison because he was selling pot and cocaine. He's in prison because he ordered some, a hit on someone, like a mob boss. And they were like, this dude's got a lot of money now and he's basically like the, at the peak of, of, of crime, they're gonna nail him. So Craig saw this and, and and by the way, that was the big factor. It was like Ross Ulbricht, he was like, okay, well, they're going after him. So maybe we, Bitcoin can escape that. And then he gets that email from, I don't know, it was Gavin or somebody. He's like, hey, check it out. WikiLeaks is gonna make Bitcoin the exclusive payment because Visa just cut them off. And he says that in his trial. He doesn't say, oh, well, I, I, I'm too embarrassed because WikiLeaks is going to take Bitcoin. It was the exclusivity of uh, 
WikiLeaks was going to get around the law entirely by taking, if it was like, oh, WikiLeaks is doing weird stuff and, and Craig disagreed with it, he didn't care. I mean, he probably doesn't like it, but he was like, all right, somebody using Bitcoin, that's fine. But once, once they took the dollar or fiat away from WikiLeaks as a donation method via Visa and MasterCard, uh, he didn't want to be like, oh, what's Bitcoin good for? It's good for skirting G20 international law. Right, And that's what he was saying, and not Craig, Satoshi was saying in the email where he goes, or the Bitcoin talk forum, he's like, they're like, hey, look at this, we got frontline headlines, WikiLeaks, and he's like, this isn't, this isn't the marketing that I want, right? Just like Nobel didn't want the marketing of like, hey, dynamite, we can kill whole cities with one 500 pound bomb, right? That's not why it's invented, it's invented for the, the sure, there's one reason you, you invent the airplane, it's a better way to kill people in the war. But there's 99% of the airplane is shipping people around the world, moving cargo faster, iPhones uh, before Christmas, all that stuff. The war part is this tiny little bit, but it's the part that gets all the attention in the beginning, right? I wrote a whole article on the Wright brothers based on sort of this concept, very similar. But the second biggest question in Bitcoin, which is why Satoshi left, is because he was embarrassed. And if if you get revealed, let's say he was revealed in 2010 instead of leaving. Well, the news at the time was Ross Ulbrich uses Bitcoin. He's the biggest criminal in the world. WikiLeaks guy is second biggest criminal in the world. What is Bitcoin good for? Criminality. Who's going next? Right? Like, do you think Tether's safe right now? CZ's in prison blabbing like a like a like a songbird and that's why Justin Sun and Tether boys are all like squeezing their sphincter together because they know they're they're next right so you go for the money behind the criminal behind FTX and that's what the government was doing in 2010 that is why Satoshi left he's like if I stay with this project and I try and run around saying no no Bitcoin's actually good they're gonna say the hell it's good uh, all it's used for is crime we're shutting you down and that's exactly what he said in the thing he goes we are too small to survive this and he was pretty much right um so second reason same as the first reason first reason why am i synonymous because i don't want i don't want to i don't want to be known as the guy who started this liberty reserve dollar when all those guys that came before me they're all either in jail or their name is mud why didn't I, why did I leave Bitcoin? Same reason. And by the way, one of the reasons why his documentation is probably so poor, and this, it doesn't go mentioned, but maybe, uh, maybe Satoshi, right? Who's been probably the number one guy in the world. Who's been a pseudonym, pseudonym for this long, maybe Satoshi, maybe, uh, put his documents in certain places that people couldn't find or with Shamir secrets or with, uh, people that could bring them out later, but not early, you know, like, or just delete them. I don't, I don't know what he did. I have no idea, but I'm just saying that's what a normal person would have done, right? Get rid of the evidence. Third biggest question in Bitcoin. Um, why did Craig, uh, not sign in 2016? If he's Satoshi, Sign publicly. Why did you shy away from it? What do you think the reason is? Well, that's a, that's an interesting point. That's really that was that was discussed for like two days straight in this trial, and you know to recap on that, you know he we Hoff was questioning right and on the stand, and he's going through you know day by day recap about the entire lead up to that to that big BBC interview, and right apparently he his reasoning in his mind was that. He had an agreement with the BBC and with uh, um, with uh, what's what's his name? The guy who was br bringing him forward. Uh, Sheldon uh, Jones uh, and uh, Robert Jones, McGregor. McGregor. McGregor uh, was going to, with the BBC, was going to allow him to pr provide his proof pack, his evidence of who he was in conjunction to signing. So like the signing was just only a little part of it, but he was going to go through a process to show this is who I am as a person. I will prove to you that this is me. The patents and whatever other businesses he'd been doing in the uh, inventions he'd been working on. You that nailed it. Now tell me why that was so important to Craig. 
Because your average guy in 2016 would have been like, whoa, we can make a lot of money with N-chain, patents, all this stuff. Like, let me just sign this thing and let's, let's crush it. Come on. Why let's is go. that so important to Craig? Why would At it that be time? Not be Wait, no, this is an important point. It's not just important to Craig. It's important to everyone. It's important to every person that would have been put in this situation. It's just that we're all so greedy and money hungry that we don't see it from his eyes. But let's say it was you, okay? Now you're thinking, well, if it was me, I would just sign, then all this shit would go away. But you're, not, you're forgetting one thing. You're forgetting that in the lead up to all that, he was destroyed, right? That, that in 2014, like I told you, Satoshi was hacked for a reason. Now, maybe Ira didn't have this reason and maybe even Jamie Wilson didn't have this reason, but Gregory Maxwell wanted to destroy uh, Bitcoin Cash slash Craig, uh, big blocking, all this stuff. Craig was too much of a, a goody two-shoe for what they wanted to use uh, BTC for, right? So he shuts it. He, he's, he's getting lambasted every day on stuff that nobody else would get lamb. Like he can't even have a degree without someone saying, oh, Charles Sturt, that's not a real university. Like, you know what? I would send my kid to Charles Sturt University just based on the fact that the inventor of Bitcoin went there, right? So Charles Sturt stock's about ready to go up, right? Uh, it may not be up yet, but if Greg proves he's Satoshi, there's going to be people in Australia going, well, that's where you go to become an inventor of money. <laughs> it's Charles Sturt University. Okay, so, but but not 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 prior to 2016, they're making fun of every bit of his life, every mistake. I mean, typos. He was getting lambasted. I, I saw he was showing somebody uh, 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 how to write code in opcodes, right? And, and he made an error that any normal program, and he was writing them like by hand. So it wasn't like he had an editor like everybody has now. Like, oh, I'm such a good coder. Meanwhile, the editor corrects every mistake you make, right? Uh, back back before editors for IDEs and everything, the stuff that Zhao Wei's doing, if you made a mistake, you didn't realize it until you press run, and then the bug happens, and then you got to figure out, did I, did I misspell something? Did I miss a period? Well, he did something like that. I, I could describe it better when I saw it. But they lambate. They're like, no, nobody would ever make a coding mistake. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't even make sense. But online, where everybody's all ganged up, it makes perfect sense. Everybody's like, well, I guess that's right. Like, why would Satoshi make an error with opcode stuff? He's supposed to know that. Well, shit, I know Swift. I know how to program in Swift. Doesn't mean I can pass a test uh, on the chalkboard and not make a mistake where it doesn't where it compiles perfectly. So these are perfectly reasonable mistakes that any human being would make. But for Craig, it was like, it was like an opportunity to destroy his entire life's work. And that's what people are forgetting. People are forgetting like this guy had a career. He was a millionaire prior to Bitcoin. He, BDO was paying him uh, six or maybe even seven digits per year, right? This is not a guy who's like, oh, well, uh, you know, if my current gig goes away, I'm going to have nothing. This is a guy who rides on that resume that sat on LinkedIn that they all made fun of. So now he's thinking, okay, everything that I do, every single little thing is destroyed, no matter how small it is. Do you think that when he signed in 2016 publicly, do you honestly think they're going to let that go? You think it seems like it wouldn't have stopped there. It wouldn't have, it would have only been the start. We already have the answer. We don't even need to guess because in this trial, they went through the whole Gavin signing and it wasn't enough to have a brand new computer. It wasn't enough to have Gavin sitting in front of it. It wasn't enough to do anything. And I just had this uh, talk with Zhao Wei and he was like, well, if he just uh, does what Gavin said and put it on Gavin's computer. No, because they would have then just said Gavin's part of the, the conspiracy and that Craig paid him off. There is no technical proof that will prove you are Satoshi. Code is not law. Code doesn't solve everything. And there is no way that no matter what Craig does with steganography or signing coins or uh, producing the PGP key, he can get all those things with a gun to Dave Kleiman's head.
You gonna give me all these things? Or am I gonna have to shoot you in the head? I guess you're gonna give me all those things. And then you're gonna die of mysterious circumstances that will, you know, most people would agree. I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's natural causes, but like not anymore, because Craig signed. Now, now all this research goes into well, how could have Craig poisoned Dave Kleiman in his deathbed, even though he's half dead anyway? There's gonna be a whole research segment of BTC with millions of dollars and free BTC donations, figuring out how Craig could have killed Dave Kleiman, uh, Garrett, whatever the hell his name is, the CIA. Hal Finney as well. Don't forget him. How he killed Hal Finney. <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> right? They, but this is how this trial is going. If I saw, if I even saw one instant where any, any lawyer for Copa was like, all right, good point, Craig. You got us there. Let's move on because we're not going to beat you on that. If I saw that once, or even if I just saw, well, we acknowledge that you're really smart in forensics. They won't acknowledge any of it. None of it. Not one bit. It's the whole story is Craig's entire life is a fraud. Everything. And so how are you going to sign in public, whether it's a new computer or Harvard does it, or it doesn't fucking matter they will rip it apart and move on with their four trillion dollar industry of casino bullshit they'll continue moving on with that because that's what pays the bills for them that's what gets them into the clubs with the dancers and the whole deal and the cocaine and all the stuff they're doing off of silk road like they're not going to stop that because craig signed are you kidding me so it doesn't matter and craig knows this and he knows this in this trial and that's why like in the lead up to today where everybody's like well Today's the day he really inhales it to him because he's going he's gonna to prove that the spaces in between the Bitcoin white paper say, uh, Craig Wright is awesome and I am Satoshi, or whatever. Or he's going to, uh, you know, produce the perfect white paper. And we saw perfectly today. That was not the case. He wasn't trying to make the perfect white paper. What he was trying to say was, look, if I use latex, and I program the white paper. And even though I don't have the proper setup because I don't have 2009 software to make it look identical like all you, you all want me to do, uh, I can make it look pretty damn close. And then look, and then he was describing this all day today. He goes, look, and he's saying this to the, to the lawyers are like doing what we all do. They're like, fuck you, Craig. It doesn't produce the perfect white paper. Nobody's going to care because everybody's dismissing everything except the 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 gotcha thing, right? You sign the coins, PG Peaky. They all want this, this magical, this is the proof and nobody will doubt you after this, right? But even his own lawyers wouldn't accept anything but that. So they're like, yeah, just forget all that stuff. And Craig's like, no, 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 let me explain. So he brings him ag again a month later. And this is, th this is the whole part of gunning, trying to prove that Craig was uh, a fraud, right? Because he was, he was, he was doctoring, uh, white papers for them. It turns out he was doctoring copies of white papers because the other white paper, the original stuff was already submitted to court. So that was completely false. But he's like, yeah, you were trying to submit these things after you doctored them. And he's like, no, that's not why I submitted them. I submitted them so I could show you that if you make one tiny change in latex, you can alter the whole document so it looks like, 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 a, like a kid did the margins. Like it looks screwed up. And he's like, that's how easy it is. He mentioned it in the court case. He goes, he, he mentioned a physics uh, uh, reference that not many people would get unless you've tried to do uh, three body motion. But any asshole can calculate gravity between the earth and the moon or between the earth and the sun. But if you try and calculate gravity, like there's a, the sun has a little bit of an effect on the moon that makes it so it doesn't go perfectly elliptical around the earth. It, it kind of wobbles and does this weird stuff. And if you can't explain those shifts, uh, then you look like an idiot, right? Because, you know, when you're doing space stuff, you got to get pre precise readings. Like if you're going to land something on Venus, you got to get that stuff nailed, right? You can't be missing these little uh, tiny errors here on earth become big errors when you're thousands of miles away, right? It's like shooting, right? Everybody knows shooting from a long distance is very hard because if you're off by uh, a tenth of a percent, you miss the deer by a mile, right? But if he's up close, you can miss by 10% and you can hit part of the deer. So it's same thing. So all this is going on today. And 
Craig's like, no, you idiots thought I was going to come in and produce a perfect white paper. That's not even possible because I, I already told you in my witness statement that you would need a 2009 copy of latex, which doesn't exist anymore. You'd have to have the patches for that latex, which don't which would be almost impossible to create. So you're asking me to do a Herculean feat of going back 10 years, assembling all these various pieces of software, the the steganography shit that I was using, all these are going to have these little tiny effects. And he called it, a th a, a, he, he goes, it's, there's four variables in steganography that if you change any of them, the whole thing, it changes everything else. So it gets really complicated. And, and so he demonstrated perfectly that he understands th these concepts. And what he was basically trying to tell you is, I'm not trying to prove that I can create the perfect white paper. I'm trying to explain how if you follow what I'm showing you, I will show you that latex could account for some of the differences in all the white papers because I use latex for every single one of them. And so if on this paper, there's a little bit different than this paper, that can be explained by latex, but it cannot be explained by open office. Do you see the point? So he is, in a way, it's kind of funny because he's giving you the silver bullet that everybody wants. But it's in a way that you actually have to do a little work and have some knowledge of how software works and how forensics works. You have to have multidisciplinary talent to put that all together and go, oh, my God, you're right, Craig. That's actually the perfect. That's almost as good as having the credit card uh, provider send a document to the court that proves that uh, my credit card was used to buy Bitcoin.org in August that, 2008. Yeah, to that point, you know, Jack, you bring this up. It's really good. I mean, we're in, uh, I'm so glad to hear your perspective because if you go back to the Mrs. Fields, which was his uh, solicitor that submitted the late evidence in December and it was accepted by the court, it was this big, long uh, paper about how critical and significant this latex evidence was. Remember that? And yep. now you're bringing it full circle for me because I've, I've kind of been wondering, I'm like, How's this latex thing? It seems to be getting destroyed. But no, you know, it's not it destroyed like at all. It's just Craig's point in this whole trial. And I don't know, you know, part of me wants to believe he's playing 5D chess and he just lets his own auditor screw it up. And, and that way he can demonstrate his knowledge and, and prove himself the proper way. The way that I know that he's Satoshi, I don't have any smoking bullets, right? And I don't say I'm 99.9% .9 sure or 90, I'm 100% sure. I've been 100% sure since probably March of 2019, and every detail I've gotten since then has only hardened that, right? And so that's how much I believe, and I have no smoking gun. I've never seen Craig sign. I don't know anything. I mean, I might know more than some of you because I've interacted with him a bit, but like, I don't have any smoking gun, but I know he's Satoshi beyond all doubt. Now, did he have help in certain areas? Did someone help him program a function here? Did, you know, of course, I don't know any of those. I mean, I might know some of them, but I don't know like major details about what Dave did or any of that stuff. All I can tell you is no matter who helps me in Slictionary, it is my vision. It is my design. It is my creation. And I had help. I'm, I'm, I'm going to always have help in Slictionary. There'll always be people doing stuff for me. Some of them will be volunteered. Some will be paid. And it's going to be a big menagerie. It's, it's a mosaic of people that go into Slickshire. And frankly, we're only the platform. Then all the people come in and define things and earn the money. So I'm a, I end up being a small part of it at the end of the day. But I am the fountainhead of Slickshire, right? And, and this is Craig's point. It's like, if you want to direct attention away to this other guy, that's fine. But this freaking project is mine. Like, read the uh, – I give a dollar to anybody that can send me the, the Von Perling um, – not the interview where he talks about meeting Satoshi. I've seen that one and I, I know where to find that one. But there's one where he says, someday Craig is going to prove the point of the difference between identity and Bitcoin. Be well, he says it in a cryptographic uh, sense where he says, uh, Craig's going to show people there's going to be a time in the future. And he says this years ago. He says, there's going to be a time in the future where Craig proves to people what cryptography can do and what it cannot do. And that is what we are witnessing in this trial. Vaughn Perling interview. I don't know if it's an interview, but there's this, there's this oh. quotation from him where somebody's asking him about Satoshi or actually it's Craig. And he says something like, there's going to be a point in time 
where this guy shows us what cryptography can do and what cryptography cannot do. And that is I'll what find it and put it in a card here as well in this video. So people can watch that one. And also the, uh, the old climbing podcast that that was another one that you mentioned uh, uh, by Andres R R Rivera. I'll find both right. of those. So, uh, but I'll give a dollar in uh, Bitcoin to anybody that can, uh, cause I, I can find some of that stuff, but I, I hate doing all that search stuff because oh, I've already seen it. So it's really consider it done. It'll be on. It'll be linked to this video when it when it goes out. So so let's uh let's go dip back and and just you know conclude on this trial. We got okay. Wait wait. Let's finish the four biggest oh, the questions. Four, yeah. Bitcoin. So the the answer to question number three is why didn't Craig sign in 2016? Because it wasn't going to solve his reputational risk. And what does he say in this trial? And what did he say then? He basically said, put out the package to, to prove that I'm not a fraud, that my degrees are good, that my certifications are quality. I am who I say I am. And, and, and give me back my reputation, which is what anybody would want, right? Okay, great. You can make a zillion dollars doing Bitcoin. But if you don't have your reputation, you have nothing. I mean, my dad, this is the only major lesson that my dad gave me. He goes, your good name is what I give you. That is my gift to you. I have kept myself clean. Nobody thinks I'm a criminal and I give you my good name. Take care of it yourself and hand your sons and daughters a good name, right? That was my dad's, uh, everybody in my family was only two people, got a watch from my dad. And in the watch was a, a like a poetic thing that said, I give you my good name. I don't think my dad wrote it. It's probably a poem by somebody else, but it was really important to me and everybody in my family and super important to my dad because you know, he's seen what can happen to you when your reputation goes to shit. It's, 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 it's a, even if you don't go to prison, it's a jail cell that you cannot escape. Think of a, a rape charge when you're in college, right? Does it matter that you didn't do the rape? Maybe you're gay and there's no way you raped the girl. And maybe you weren't even in the house that night, but if you're written up in the college newspaper as well, this guy's being charged with rape by some girl, I mean, you can't even go to a college mixer at that point, right? Your reputation is maybe permanently damaged because nobody, people may not believe that you didn't do it, even though you have the proof in court. But in the immediate term, nobody treats you the same way. It's like, oh, God, that guy. I saw Craig Wright in, in a uh, kind of a she-she um, charity thing in New York City uh, that we were both at, and nobody would talk to him. They all knew who he was. They wouldn't talk to him. Why do you think that is? Because people don't want to associate with criminals. And his reputation is criminal. To this day, it is. I mean, look at this court case. They're literally charging him with fraud every time he opens his mouth. And so this is why he did not sign in 2016. This is the base reason, which is the same reason he left Bitcoin. And it's the same reason he took the pseudonym. It's his reputation that's taking the, the, the hit. And so the final question about Satoshi, maybe not today, people won't view it as the biggest, uh, fourth biggest question in Bitcoin, but the fourth biggest question of Bitcoin is being answered in this trial, which is why won't Craig sign? Why won't he produce PGP key? Why won't he uh, show steganographic proof? Why won't he uh, create the perfect white paper with latex? Why won't he show uh, the credit card receipt? Because none of those are proof. He even said it today. They said, well, if you could produce uh, this uh, white paper thing, that, that was the first thing this guy led with, Gunning. He goes, well, if you produce this thing today that everybody's expecting, uh, that's pretty good proof that you're Satoshi, correct? And Craig's like, no. And everybody's like, what? I mean, Judge is like, no, that would be really good, Craig. You, you should do that. And Craig's like, no, that is not how it works. He goes, it would be additional to my claim as Satoshi. But again, people just like, oh, well, nobody... If you just sign the coins, everybody will believe you. They're not going to say you murdered people. Well, that's what we're seeing in the court case. We're seeing exactly that they're going to say he's murdering people. They're already ruining every single detail of his reputation. All of it. And you think they're going to stop just because he signed coins? No way. In fact, I'll make a prediction. If Craig wins this case, the judge declares him Satoshi, uh, things will change but they won't change as fast as everybody wants. If there's a thousand people and 999 of them say that BTC is Bitcoin and one of us says that BSV is Bitcoin, it will change such that 
maybe two, three, four, five people then after say, huh, uh, yeah, I see all that stuff you're putting out, Copa, about Craig being a bad guy, and now the judge is in on it. Probably paid off the judge. Judge uh, is paid off. <laughs> like, oh, it's in the UK, so this is just the UK's way of getting Bitcoin all to themselves. If they, you know, Craig's, the reason they can't why even get air conditioning in that court. It's probably a fake court, right? They're all right. sweating in there. Oh, Craig CIA, and this is all a, a cabal uh, from Craig to try and push central bank digital currencies and all this goody two shoe shit. When all we really want is ANCAP revolutionary money that defies the government, and now Craig's part of the government, and it's all a rig against us, and the Earth is flat, and we didn't go to the moon. <laughs> right that you Craig's know this the, is all common yeah. craig's a fed that's the next that's the next craig's thing the fed's the next story right uh he didn't invent bitcoin they're already saying it the fed invented bitcoin and they're put see mastercard's involved and this but he, it's not true craig invented bitcoin there is no cia conspiracy he's not i mean granted his grandfather worked at bletchley park maybe for like uh six months during world war ii that's all true but he is not cia i mean I have my own connections to certain things in the government in that respect. And I can tell you these secret squirrel things that people come up with, not even close. It's just not believable by anybody who's actually uh, dealt with some of that stuff. So anyway, this is my point. The answer to all four of the biggest questions in Bitcoin is the same answer. It's about a man retaining the work of his life and having maybe not respect for it. He doesn't expect you to be like, oh God, you're the no. greatest guy ever. Dignity. Just some, just give me some average dignity. Forget the fact that I just invented a new money or that I solved the Byzantine general's problem or that I've written steganography, but any of this stuff, forget all that. You don't want to give me credit for that. That's fine. But don't be like calling me a shit bag and a criminal and a forger. Like this is a guy who's produced so many papers. I had to laugh this 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 stinking trial because I, I can't even tell you how much shit there is that he's written, and yet they pick one paper out, and they realize that oh well if we if if we say that he copied this part in his um in his uh, thesis, that's a problem because he actually did reference it. <laughs> Plagiarists don't be like oh let me let me steal from gavin mail where i quote all this stuff paragraphs of gavin's stuff but then uh reference number three is gavin mail's book <laughs> <laughs> how dumb of a plagiarist do you have to be to do that so that they, they couldn't use that stuff so they found the one citation that he didn't put in there and he described it perfectly he goes i use citation software i'm i write so many papers that I actually have software where I can quickly look up references. When I reference something, I can be like, well, I just talked about um, uh, E equals MC squared. Who, who did that again? Oh, that's Einstein. Okay. Uh, well, let me make sure the date's right on that. Yeah, 1902. Yeah, yeah that's about right. So he sticks that in, right? Because um, it's, like, it's like me asking the, you guys where this uh, Von Perling thing is. Like, I know it exists. I know I've seen it. I know I've read it. But I can't find it really quickly. So he's got software that does that for him, right? So he uses the software, and the reason why the, the girl, it's, I think it's a female, uh, the reason why the girl that he quoted is not in the reference is because the soft, it was a blog. He was quoting from a blog, and the software only did books, uh, academic journals, uh, you know, magazines, and, and whatever. It didn't have blogs because the software is old, right? It's like, uh, uh, what's that stuff that we used to use in the hedge fund industry? Uh, Marcus Parkus, LexisNexis. Right. LexisNexis was like this weird software where everybody was doing the Internet searches, but then you could search everything else that wasn't on the Internet because that's what LexisNexis had. Now we just all use Google for everything. But back then, the software company provided the references. So he, he explains all that perfectly. But do you think they're like, oh, OK, well, let's leave that one alone because no, but that was one reference out of how many papers that guy's written books. And I don't, I don't know if you've read any of his articles a, a bunch, but aren't, aren't you ever amazed at how many references he has? Like, like I play, I probably plagiarize all the time, not on purpose, but like, I, I'm, I'll be just talking and talking in my article, and I'm not going to reference every single thing that I've learned over time and credit the right people. 
I'll try and get the big ones, right? Five or six. And then I'm sure I'm screwing somebody, but I don't have everybody looking at my papers going, well, you're not Jack Pitt, so let's prove that you're a forger and that you're a plagiarist. And you would find, if you looked up my articles, they would have a field day. And they'd be like three per article. They'd be like, yeah, and you borrowed that. And look how how you've changed two words in that sentence you use. And really it was Gavin that said that, but you just changed it to, I'd be in so much hot water. They found one, one out of millions of lines that he's written. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's reputation is the answer for the four biggest questions in Bitcoin. And it will help you understand, not you personally, but I mean, it'll help people understand that like, that's what this is about. It's, a, it's not about I can sign the coins or PGP key or, or, or steganographic proof. What it's about is I have a whole body of work and all of it points to Bitcoin. How could you, Judge Meller, how could you be so fucking obtuse that I can sit here over 40 days and prove to you that I understand steganography and forensics, and I have a better understanding than forensics than the damn experts in my own case, because I was an expert in these cases, and I can tell you that they're not doing the actual experimental proof. You cannot quiz me on Bitcoin's Merkle tree and get away with it and try and tell me it's not a binary tree. That was another fun one from today. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? Of course Merkle tree is a binary tree. That's the whole reason it's there, so you can search it, what a what a binary tree does is allow you to search for someone's name in the phone book the way a person does it. You open to the middle, you're like, well, it's R, not M. Then you try and find the R's, and you go to the second half of the phone book, and you've eliminated half the phone book. That I mean, that's the first. That's how they teach you binary tree. That's exactly what SPV and uh, the Merkle tree does. And and Craig's pointed out endless amounts of times that if if we were only going to have seven transactions per second, there's no reason for a Merkle tree. Because any computer that was made af after 1957 can search, uh, what is it, seven transactions a second times 10 minutes. It's not a big number. Any computer that's ever been made can search that file and find what it's looking for in a split second. But if you have a terabyte of data in a block, good luck. You need a binary tree. Uh, we, we all learn this in computer science. It's like, it's like sophomore year level of college of computer science that everybody, if you have a ginormous data set, you have to use a binary tree. And Craig points this out every single time and people are like, oh yeah, whatever you say, Craig. And nobody thinks about it and go, yeah, well, if we did have a terabyte block, how the hell would we find my transaction in that? It would take hand cash and uh gorilla uh pool a zillion years to find your damn transaction to to verify it so of course you need a merkle tree yeah. uh and that's the whole point and and he, he brought that out perfectly today and they still in the courtroom for the judge spun that is wow look what an idiot you are craig it's it's cs 101 that a merkle tree is not the same as a binary tree and he had to school them. And I think, honestly, I mean, I think the judge seems like a really nice dude and he, he seems very smart. I think it's working on him. I think Cope is doing a pretty good job on him. Now, I, I could be surprised, but, uh, you know, one thing I'll say is this for the for the poor old judge. Did you know the story of um, the etymology for the expression, your name is mud? No. Have you ever heard of it? I, uh, You know, just... The etymology I've heard of, but I haven't heard the two together. No. Yeah, like yeah, I'll give you like oh, you get caught spanking somebody else's uh, kid, your name's gonna be mud in the neighborhood or whatever. You know, it means your your reputation is gonna be ruined, is what it means. Now maybe people don't say that anymore because it's a pretty old term. Well, mud, Doctor Mud, M U D D, was in like South Carolina. Uh, Lincoln got shot, murdered, in uh, the balcony or whatever, and. Uh, this is funny because I can I can barely remember the killer's name. I think it's like a triple John name. Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth. But I remember Mud, but I don't remember John Wilkes Booth. And this is the point of the story. So John Wilkes Booth kills the president of the United States. And he runs and he gets away. And he, he finds somebody to hide him in like the carriage house of his farm in South Carolina. Dr. Mud. Dr. <laughs> Mud hid... John Wilkes Booth for like three days or something. And he eventually was caught, I guess, but like 
it came out like mud shit like dude i just killed the president like what are you doing so the expression came about that you will be humiliated if you do something bad you'll be humiliated your name will be mud will be mud so why is your name not booth the, the guy who housed john wilkes booth you'll you'll your name will be mud the guy who all he did he didn't kill the president he didn't run all he did was harbor a criminal and he was viewed as the biggest villain in the story like john wilkes booth yeah you're crazy like your mom spanked you too many times whatever there's something wrong with you you've got a screw loose but mud you're a damn doctor like, you know better than this. Like, you can't harbor a criminal that just killed the leader the of our country. Like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, you're an idiot. Like, your name will be mud. And uh, this concept is kind of like what we're seeing here in, the, in, this, in this courtroom, right? It's like <laughs> you help Craig, you associate with Craig. Like, you're at risk. I'm at risk. All of our reputations are... Anybody, this is why nobody will really, even in BSV, people try and keep a little silent, like, oh, you know, BSV is the best technology. What about Craig? He's a criminal. Oh, I, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, they know. It's not like anybody in BSV doesn't think Craig is, is Satoshi. But it's like that story in the Bible, right? It's like, well, Peter, you're, you're going you're gonna to soil my name three times before the rooster crows, is the old expression. And he does. Because... When the whole world's against you and puts all this pressure on you, are you really going to believe that whack job? This uh, Craig Wright guy invented Bitcoin? Like, this is what you're hanging your hat on? And it becomes tough. It's societal pressure. And uh, it takes a lot of balls to go out and say, no, I I think he's Satoshi. In fact, uh, I think he's a good guy. Like, I think he's completely painted wrong. I mean, you know this, right? This goes on in our, in our own country in other areas every single day. You're not allowed to like this doctor because he said something wrong about COVID. You're not allowed to like the, this political candidate because he said something that's against your political religion. And it's like you can't even so hardly say hello to anybody without them pegging you like, well, you're in this cult. That's what's going on these days. And I, I think this court case is maybe when we get the turning point and say, hey, maybe there's a little bit of grit to life and not everything's black and white and NASCAR race car drivers occasionally die in car accidents on the regular old highway and security experts get hacked and the world's just not so easy as this social media would like you to believe and that I think is why Craig in my opinion will not gravitate towards giving you the easy proof He's testing everyone. He's saying, you you think this technology is any good? Prove it. Not that you have to say that I'm Satoshi, but prove it by forming a business, build something with it. Uh, you know, this is what I gave, this is what I created it for. Yeah, right? one, yeah, just to dovetail on that, you know, the the one thing about Craig that you could say is is this guy leads by example. You know, there's nobody that that could say that hasn't worked harder and done more work. And now the Terra node. It looks like, and the, I mean, just his, his lead by example, uh, attitude is unprecedented. Unprecedented. And I'll say one more thing, and this is kind of important for the near term. Everybody thinks they have to qualify. Well, of course I think Craig is Satoshi, but you know, he's kind of an asshole. Like every once in a while, if you challenge him on changing the protocol and although that might be true, in fact, that is true, but you don't have to qualify right now. You want to you want to like qualify stuff with Craig and say what you don't like about him. Give it five years. Wait until wait until he is Satoshi and that he's bigger than life and his head is so large and he you know he's barrel chested everywhere. <laughs> Save it for that because then it would be probably do him some good. But right now, the man needs no qualification. Right, nine hundred and ninety nine and sometimes one thousand nine hundred ninety nine people out of two thousand shit on him every single day and that put yourself in his shoes for just a second you go get your shoes shined and someone's like aren't you that craig wright character yes well yes i am how do you like my shoes i heard you're a fraud <laughs> <laughs> right? like, like go get your shoes shine somewhere else like imagine that happens to you every single day um it's 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 a it's a nightmare and so of course he said to robert mcgregor Prove me first, then I sign. 
And so I'll make a prediction for this trial. He will not do any uh, gotcha proofs. There won't be a steganographic proof. He's not going to whipsaw a bunch of <laughs> scrappy software from all over the world to produce a perfect white paper because it wouldn't matter anyway. They'd still rip it apart somehow. There'd be a, a T not crossed or a pixel missing, and they would still say it's not. They would still say it was uh, open office and not latex. Um, if he does have zingers, it will be like the one today where you're like, oh. Uh, that forger actually wasn't Craig. It makes, makes much more sense that it was Christian Auger Hansen because look <laughs> at the photo shot that he took of Craig's Linux computer or his uh, Microsoft computer, but it turns out it's Linux. Uh, so there might be some of that, but again, you have to have some knowledge to understand that. Um, so there won't be any of that. It will not be revealing PGP keys, even though he, he, he he's lost them. Uh, so he can't, <laughs> but I think in the end, there'll be something cool. It just won't be what you're thinking it is. But it, it might actually be even cooler. And I, I don't want to say what it is, because it's like one of those things, like when you blow out your candles, you're not supposed to tell everybody what your wish is. It turns out you should tell everybody what your wish is, because it's much easier for you to get it that way. Well, but Keep people guessing. Make them at this point. But there's a reason to not do it, do things the way everybody wants you to do. And you just have to consider that maybe it's not all about you, right? Maybe Craig's whole existence isn't so that you can make a thousand percent in your BSV holdings or that you get your financing for your startup or any of that stuff. And I think he would love for all that to happen for people. I really do. But his reputation comes first, right? Like, I'm not going to take that away from him. And I don't think anybody should ask him to. So... And he's financing his own court case. I know I know a little bit more than most people about that because I'm in finance, but uh, he's he's paying all of this out of his own nut. So he's allowed to do whatever the hell he wants, honestly. If my name and reputation were on the line and my family, my, my wife and my kids had to grow up every day and they go to school and other school kids are like, I heard your dad's a fraud, you little asshole. I mean, imagine what that would do to you. It, it would kill me my kids couldn't go to school without being ridiculed and he mentioned that in the court case he's like he's like no i didn't plan on coming out right away as satoshi he's like i i, I made some agreements one, one of my kids to be of age yeah i wanted the kids to be settled in in england and have some stability in their life before we just blow them away with this crazy signing shit, right where they're gonna tear me apart the second i sign it they're gonna say i'm a murderer like he knows this is coming because it's already been happening. It's like he doesn't even need to guess. So I don't know. I, I think people, they don't put themselves in another person's shoes. And if you do, you'll see it. This is what I did. I, this, I did this for a career, right? I had to put myself in other people's shoes so that I could understand their business and where they're, I could understand whether they are a fraud or not a fraud. This is, I mean, most of my life as a, as a hedge fund guy was actually the best part of it was finding the longs and that was what I was really good at. But what I started off doing is finding all the, the fraudulent shorts. I spent the entire dot com crisis identifying real fraud. And, uh, you know, some people love that. I didn't, it, it didn't suit me. I'm an optimistic guy and I don't like uncovering fraud that much. I think it's kind of interesting, but after you do it one or two times and you, you know, you, you figure out that something's a fraud and, and you get paid on it, it's great, but it's it's like uh, cheap calories, right? Like, what are you really doing that's good? You're eliminating some bad people, but, and I wrote a paper about this, uh, not a paper, but I wrote an article about this, which is uh, called um, Bitcoin's Got Talent. The, the idea is find your light, find your motivation, the thing that makes you excited, not the thing where you're like, you know, putting other people in jail or you don't like bad people and you want them to get their, to get theirs and all that, but find, the thing that tickles your fancy that makes the world uh, cool for you. And if you make the world cool for you, chances are there's gonna be a lot of other people that think that's cool too. Not everyone, but if you like, man, I wanna make a really cool dictionary where like I can track the etymology of words from their origin so that when someone invents a new word, they can get credit for it and put it down into the timestamp server and say, I'm sorry, Snoop Dogg. I'm the one that came up with the shizzle my nizzle, not you. 
and I, I, it's right here on the blockchain. You can use it in your song, and everybody will give you credit because you're famous, but it's in black and white. I invented this expression. To hell with you. And and so, why should everybody, uh, you know, go and check out, is it uh, Slictionary, Jack? How, why should everybody go check it out? Maybe you can give a challenge at the end here for everyone as, as we're closing. I am not in marketing mode with Slictionary right at this second because there's some uh, uh, rejiggering of the internals at the moment uh, on a technological basis. So I don't want everybody to, uh, Slictionary totally works still and it will work forever until I'm dead and beyond that. So there's no problem there, but there's there's some things I have to catch up on because I'm taking more of a bigger role on, on the programming programming side, and uh, I have to. I don't want everybody can continue using it as it is, but there's going to be some uh, some things I'm doing by hand right now, like paying people, and it, it you know, once I get all that set, I'm going to be in marketing mode. But right now, Slictionary works. It's got some great words in there. Um, uh, if you want to know the real definition of hyper Bitcoinization, we are the only dictionary in the world that has the official uh, definition written by the guy who invented the word, uh, Daniel Krawitz. Uh, that is a NFT like object that I call a sink. Um, it's a inf basically an information sink, but it's a, a tradable sink uh, that um, I forget the guy who bought it, but he bought it for, I think, one hundred and forty four dollars. And uh, that will be something I think uh, that we were worth way more than $144 as our dictionary grows. So I'm, I'm super excited about Slictionary. I think it'll turn into an encyclopedia over time. It already does have some qualities of that nature already. And uh, it's only going to get better. But, uh, you know, if you want to make a little bit of BSV or tell your kids or, or anybody who's interested in, in, in come to Slictionary, hit Word Bounty and uh, define a word on the word bounty contests. And uh, they're pretty easy to win if you put any kind of effort in. Don't plagiarize, don't use chat GBT. I'm catching all those people, so don't bother. But if you if you put it in your own words and you do a good job, uh, you'll make a little bit of BSV and uh, your name will be written in history in a good way, unlike Dr. Mudd. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Everybody check out Slictionary, but before it sounds like you're not quite ready for a big uh, onslaught of people yet, but just uh, it's going to be coming. And thank you for your insight on this trial. It was incredibly valuable. And the perspective that you gave here was so different than I think of anyone else out there on, on this. And hopefully it gives people a good reset on uh, where we are in this case right now uh, and, and what we can potentially expect. So thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom. I hope to have you back here soon. And you could give us uh, next time, take us back into the old glory days of the dot com and how, you know, how, how, what it was like going into the old stock picking days. I mean, when before Amazon existed, you know, that would be fantastic, a phenomenal story to hear next time. You know, hey, so. man, it's all the, it's all the same story happening all over again. Just keep your eyes open and you'll see everything that I saw back then today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, Jack, how do you do it? Thank you. All right, we'll see you at the top. Thank you, everybody.